Okay, so let me start out with this question of what is creativity, which seems like sort of like an obvious question. Maybe it's doing something new. But um, I have a doctoral student who's now a professor at UC Davis named Andy Hargadon. And Andy and I spent quite a few years fretting over this. In fact, he talks a lot about this in his new book, which is called How Breakthroughs Happen. And um, the thing that we came upon in every creative act we could look at, essentially, it was doing new things with old things. It's not like the ideas come out of thin air. It's finding some old ideas, some old concepts, doing new things with them, blending them together in new ways. And this is an incredibly simple insight, but it actually has a lot of guidance about what you should do and how you should organize a creative group or organization. And we'll get into that in more detail as we go along. And let me give you two extreme examples, sort of in terms of levels of complexity, to illustrate this point. The first one is the way that Play-Doh was invented. So I looked into the invention of Play-Doh for uh, my book, Weird Ideas That Work. And, and what we discovered was Play-Doh was invented, um, or at least made, by a guy named Joe McVicker, who had a plant. It was a plant in uh, central Ohio that made white goo for removing soot from wallpaper. Uh, maybe some of the professors in this room are old enough to remember there was a point where uh, much of the heat in the United States switched from being coal-based heating, which was sort of dirty and smudging, to, um, to gas and electric. So the problem was that the smudge was going down and this market was shrinking. And the problem Joe McVicker had is, what did he do with this goo that was being made from his plant, this white goo? And he did what people tend to do, which is he called in industry experts who had a great deal of, deal of knowledge about sort of soot and wallpaper and all that sort of stuff. And they told them essentially to do a total quality management movement, get the thing more efficient, squeeze every penny, penny out of it. Six Sigma would be the modern term. Um, but then things kept getting worse and worse until he talked to his um, sister-in-law, Kay Zufall. And Kay Zufall was a nursery school teacher. And she gave it to her kids to play with. And she said, this stuff is much easier for little kids to squeeze with their hands than the hard modeling clay. And she suggested um, coloring it and calling it Play-Doh, and the rest is history. He sold the plant to Kenner for millions of dollars some years later. So that's one example. And to give you a whole other extreme of complexity, there's a great case some of you may know about um, of the case of a guy named Andrew Wiles. Andrew Wiles was a professor who solved Fermat's last theorem. And there's a movie about it and a book about it you can um, look up. But the interesting thing about Andrew Wiles was that he stayed at home working in his study for eight years, eight years, and he didn't tell his colleagues what he was working on. In fact, they thought he went crazy and just had stopped being productive. And I could just see it if I wrote on my Stanford annual report, I've been in my room working at home, but I won't tell you what I'm working on. Essentially, that's what he did for eight years. Um, and, he, and even us academics would get in trouble. This is the advantage of the tenure system. He had tenure. Um, but what he was doing during those eight years was he was using the various work of the mathematicians who came before him as puzzle pieces to solve the problem. So even in the case where you have somebody sitting in a room by himself for eight years working on stuff, it's not like the ideas come out of nowhere. It's picking all that came before him. And to use the Isaac Newton phrase, the reason he could travel so far was because he was standing on the shoulders of the mathematicians who came before him. And to give you a couple of other examples I've got pictures for, and this is really sort of simple creativity that made huge bucks. I did some uh, consulting work with People Magazine about a year ago. And the most profitable thing they've done in recent years in People Magazine is a thing called the annual. What the annual is, you know when you see People Magazine in the store, they'll be like the best dress, the best looking, the most intriguing, those sort of issues. What they do is they smash it all together and sell to you for, in a book for $10, no original content at all. That's an annual, and they made a fortune on those things. So that's, that's one example. And another example, which has more technology in it, since this is a technology ventures program operation, is if you look at the iPod, um, they went from having no product to having the product out in eight months. And for those of you who know this story, um, most of it was not original except for the interface and the industrial design. It was nearly all off-the-shelf stuff, and that's how they could move so quickly. And in fact, I think this is an especially good lesson. If you want um, to have fast creativity, 
Um, what, you don't sort of just lock yourself in a room and only think of your own ideas. Even in Andrew Weil's cases, he's um, taking places from other, um, ideas from other places. You treat creativity as an import-export business. That's how it happens fast. And that's also the reason why, and I think that that's one of the things that happens with ETL, perhaps accidentally or on purpose, one of the reasons I think Silicon Valley works so well is that there's, there's such sort of porous exchange of ideas, and this will be on videotape, but that's okay. Um, to quote our president, John Hennessy, one of the first things I ever heard him say when he was our dean was, um, one of the main services that Stanford provides um, Silicon Valley is it provides a place where people can come and break their NDAs or non-disclosure agreements and move ideas around Silicon Valley. <laughs> so, uh, so that's sort of the, the first big idea is, is that uh, to understand what creativity is, and in many ways, what you need to do to make it happen is you have to have this, this notion of doing new things with old things, okay? So that's the first idea.